All right, everybody, welcome to a live broadcast of at Cisco Live of Navigating the Cloud Journey. I'm Jim Mandelbaum, Field CTO at Gigamon. And Drew, why don't you introduce yourself? Yeah, hi everyone, Drew Horn, Senior Director at Sumo Logic. So we're going to kind of get started with a very common problem. We know that as people are making this cloud journey, that's what this is all about, is moving to the cloud. We see a lot of people doing lift and shift. And we know that lift and shift typically does not achieve any of the goals that they're trying to achieve. Maybe you can kind of address why that is and some of the problems. A lot of problems, a lot of challenges, I would say. My particular area of expertise comes more from DevOps and the CI CD pipelines. And one thing that I think a lot of people don't think about, for me as a developer, okay, I got to take this monolithic app that's running bare metal in my data center. I've got to break it up into 10, 20, 50 different microservices. I've got to go build out message queues in AWS. I've got to go use Lambda. I've got to use one of their 5,000 or all 5,000 of their services to get this application up and running in the cloud. But one thing that I think a lot of people don't think about is how do you get that app there? How do you transport that app there? And what are the implications of your current CI CD pipeline that you're using today? And what is that going to look like? Can in I order stop to you real solve? quick yeah. just to make sure? Just, what is CI CD? I call it acronym hell. So anytime my guest says an acronym, I'm going to make them explain. We're going to count them. How many strikes do I get today? Yes, we'll see. That's <laughs> one CI CD. Yeah, continuous integration and continuous delivery. So this is the process of taking your source code, compiling it down to bytecode or a binary and then packaging that up and then delivering it continuously in an automated way out to the servers or out to the virtual instances or out to the cloud or out to the Kubernetes platform where it then runs. Okay, going so back to your assembly line. There you go, yeah. I like that one. Uh, so yeah. going back to your comment around the lift and shift. Yeah, so again, Apps are getting more complex. Well, guess what? So are CI CD pipelines. The process in order to build and deliver those are getting more complex. And some of the challenges, maybe they'll just kind of bring up real quick that I've seen are number one around pipeline sprawl. So what I mean by pipeline sprawl, I'm, I'm going to say it before you cut me off. Pipeline <laughs> sprawl. Yeah, I mean, think about it. Monolithic app, 15, 500, 1,000, Netflix, 10,000 plus microservices, right? So instead of one common pipeline in order to build and deploy an application, you now have hundreds potentially of pipelines. And at Sumo Logic, we do. We have dozens, if not in the low hundreds. And then you're touching the audience, you're touching your customers in different places now. So you don't just have you know, an app that runs on a Windows machine. You have one that's built specifically for Mac OS, maybe one that's built for Linux. Maybe you have a mobile property, a mobile web property, a web property. Maybe you're running an app on a TV, right? The number of different platforms that you're having to build and deploy applications it's like an order of magnitude, it's a multiplier effect in the complexity in building and deploying applications. And then another one I would say is also tool sprawls. Lots of sprawl, that's, yeah. that's, the, that's the word of the day for me, I think. It's tool sprawl, so for us, like at Sumo Logic, we use probably a dozen different tools to build and deploy our applications, what we call maybe like the DevOps tool chain. So we're using maybe Jenkins or Circle CI or GitLab to build code. We're using GitHub for version control. We're using maybe Artifactory or one of the three different major hyperscalers container registries, including Docker, make that four, to store our images. And so right? you're touching upon something that we hear quite often from C-levels is, I have too many tools, it's creating too much workload, you have to learn all these different tools. But it also goes down to another problem, which is if I've got traditional developers that are used to building monolithic apps, and now I'm saying to them, I need you to start thinking about moving these to the cloud. And when we say cloud, folks, we got to realize that on-prem cloud, when we talk about VMware, we talk about Nutanix, that's private cloud. And when you deal with AWS, Azure, Google, public cloud, cloud is cloud, right? If I'm developing to move from a traditional bare metal app and I want to move it to the cloud, there are implications for these developers and the thought process and where is it going? Yeah, I mean, for me it's, coming out of the DevOps space as a DevOps manager, I want to make sure and empower the different developer teams to use the tools that they want to use in order to build and deploy modern applications. What histori historically for me doesn't work is coming down from the top saying, hey, these are the three tools that everyone's going to use, right? A mobile developer, you know, they're going to go pick up a tool like Fastlane maybe to automatically build and deploy their service. But a backend developer may use a completely different set of tools. So it's a balancing act. You have to be able to empower your teams to use the tools that they want, 
but then as they go off and they do that, you need to make sure that everyone's following kind of the same set of best practices. And then you need to be smart about how you collect all of the data about those processes that are going on during that transformation in order to identify you know, what's working, what's not, how do we prioritize, how do we move faster. Okay, but one of the things that you were talking about is all the different tooling, but is it different when I'm developing for different cloud environments or should I keep it fairly consistent for each of those cloud environments? So in other words, if, I, if I'm looking at moving from bare metal, first step would be maybe to private cloud, right? I just got to get the microservices and start building it, but eventually I'm going to move into the public cloud, which means now I'm probably going to end up with a mix, public and private, now that yep. lovely hybrid environment we all keep talking about. How does that impact that whole situation? Yeah, I mean, it's your deployment strategy is going to be different, right? So if you're typically running, maybe you're running on hypervisors using a, you know, VMware and, and vSphere, right? And mm -hmm. then you're transitioning to maybe using Kubernetes and Amazon. Maybe you're using you know, EKS or maybe uh, GKE or all of the different I, acronyms. I normally, would, I normally would stop <laughs> you on those, but folks, let's just say that those are the <laughs> Kubernetes environments in the public cloud. Man, man. Yeah, so I mean, it's, it's really about just being smart about just understanding that those are different types of platforms, different architectures, and decoupling your CI CD pipeline from those environments so that as you're developing different pipelines, you just need to be smart about, okay, if I'm deploying to this service, I'm going to check the documentation, what's the best way to deploy to, to Amazon's Kubernetes service versus deploying to my legacy infrastructure maybe on VMware. But how do I maintain that continuity? All right, how do I say that? Yeah. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, for me, it's um, there's a ton of things that you need to do. One of the things for me is about, again, collecting the data, making sure that you can observe this process because, again, as those challenges talked about earlier, pipeline sprawl, tool sprawl, when you start having issues, if, you, if you're not collecting data about this process, you're going to have a hard time, again, like prioritizing where do you want to spend time and effort to optimize problems? And there's some frameworks, there's some best practices in place that help people do that. For example, the Dora metrics is a good place to start. Okay, it's acronym hell. <laughs> okay, you brought up Dora. I knew yeah. you was going to come up. So yeah. go ahead, what is Dora? Let's start there. What is Dora? So Dora is DevOps research, research and Assessment. So this is an organization that started several years ago. What they did is they spent about seven years or so conducting surveys of various DevOps engineers, developers globally and through applied data science, they came up with what are some of the key metrics, the key performance indicators that you should be keeping track of as part of that continuity process, as part of moving to the cloud or as part of increasing your software delivery performance. They actually wrote a book on it. Dr. Nicole Forsgren wrote, and her team of experts wrote a book called Accelerate. So I definitely would encourage anyone. This is required reading for tons of different uh, organizations. Some of my friends, they run quality engineering teams or they run uh, software development teams. You get hired onto this company, you have to read the first half of that book. The back half is all of the math that proves out you know, how they landed at these conclusions. And, and the I thing love. I love about this is that if we think about traditional developers and developer process, you've got a lot of le folks that have been legacy, you know, old farts like me that have been doing this a long time. And the transition from that process, you need some help. And so one of the things I would say for those of you who are in the space, or even those of you who manage developers that are starting to look at moving to the cloud, first, you need to get that book. And look, we've got no stake in this. You know, This is a, a, a generic podcast that goes out to everybody that's <laughs> by practitioners for practitioners. And the idea here is, is it'll give you an understanding that you can now manage your folks. You want to get them going on it because it really does talk about some uh, observability. That's kind of our theme there, but you have to deal with the data. And I don't want to be the one talking about it. So I'm going to let you kind of talk about yeah. some of the benefits you get out of it. Sure. So m maybe just to close out, if you cringed when you were told to just go read a book, there, the, cliff notes, <laughs> the cliff notes are available in the form of the State of DevOps report. So this is like a consolidated annual report that is put out and and funded by a bunch of different organizations, in, in including Dora. And so they'll jump into some of those key four metrics around how do you measure throughput, your deployment frequency, your lead time, how long does it take to push a release from you know, commit to production, your change failure rate, this is a measure of reliability, like how many of your deployments are resulting in customer impacting incidents, as well as MTTs. 
once that impact occurs, how long does it take you to get back into that state? So it's, mean, a, it's a mean time to resolution. We threw another acronym oh yeah, out mean, there. Mean time to resolution. Yeah. We definitely encourage you to check it out. They've also got tiers, like how long it takes for you to, where do you stand in terms of these metrics? There's like low performers, medium performers, high performers, elite performers. And there's some really astounding data in those reports about the massive advantage that teams that have reached elite status over other teams. And so this is actually something we're actively doing working on achieving elite status for all of our key production workloads at Sumo Logic. All right, so now you're talking about the elite. Now <laughs> let's talk about the other side of it, right? Yeah. When things go things, wrong. Yeah. I mean, because not everything's you know gravy. There are things that go wrong in this process. Maybe you could highlight some of the things that you've seen yeah. and, and where do you go with it? Yeah, sure. So these reports, the books, they talk a, a lot about the best practices and the frameworks. But yeah, what do you do when things go wrong? For me, it's all about a c collecting the data. So you have to be able to collect the data in order to measure these performance metrics. And uh, there's a couple ways to go about doing that, right? I mean, you could build a full stack application with the database, take a very structured approach, or how I try to think about it, I think of the CI CD pipeline as its own application. It's not your production application, but think about it. You've got you've got a CI CD maybe server, maybe you have multiple different pipelines. It's an application and you need to be able to observe it. So you need to be able to monitor, troubleshoot, diagnose it. So I think the same concepts of observability for modern apps, they apply directly to the CI CD pipeline. And so now what you can try to do is you can kind of bridge the gap and so you know, when things go wrong in a production workload, what are the things I need to have visibility into in order to solve those problems? And it all comes back to collecting the logs, metrics, and traces from your CI CD pipeline. Okay, so one of the things I know that you like to talk about is open telemetry. Yeah, trace, yeah, traces, yeah, yeah. Yeah, traces. Maybe you can kind of highlight your thoughts on that and educate what that means. Yeah, so open telemetry, it's a fantastic concept, right? I think this kind of came out of teams using traditional observability platforms where those vendors were providing their own agents in order to collect logs and metrics and traces. And that's a bit of a problem, at least for me, because what happens is you kind of get locked in to that particular vendor and their way of doing things. If you want to... Yeah, we often, we often talk about <laughs> vendor lock. That yeah. is something that, that executives, anybody at the C-level always says vendor lock is the biggest fear. Yeah, and so open telemetry has kind of come up over the last few years as a way to help give developers, give DevOps engineers, get, give your organization control of your data back, where you want to send your data. So as opposed to taking a vendor's agent to collect data, you have now have an open source community and tooling and you can decide what vendor or vendors you want to send that data to. And uh, what's really interesting to me about open telemetry is kind of coming back to the original conversation. Uh, OTEL, Open Telemetry for short. OTEL, there's a lot of focus on production workloads and observability in production. Where I want to see this go next is applying the same concept to, again, treating the CICD pipeline as an application. I want to see OTEL come into all the big vendors. So you, you've got uh, Circle CI, you've got GitLab. I mean, there's you could go on forever talking about all the different vendors, but Right now, you can collect data from all of the vendors, but it's through webhooks, it's through their own kind of proprietary format, which, which is great, don't get me wrong, but I'm really excited about some of the work going into open telemetry where people are actually instrumenting CI CD pipelines and they're emitting OTEL compliant data about traces and spans that can be collected by observability vendors. And so this now gives teams that are trying to monitor, diagnose, and troubleshoot issues in the CI CD pipeline, a common framework for understanding the performance, the bottlenecks, and really landing at the root cause of issues in your pipeline, and doing that all in a data-driven way. So if you can take those traces, you can put them in an analytics platform, and run analytics on all of, all of those traces, it makes it a lot easier to, when something goes wrong, as opposed to pointing fingers, getting frustrated, you know, reviews of what went wrong, or in sprint retrospectives, you have all of the data in place to make an informed decision about what went wrong, how can we improve, and how do we prioritize? No one only has one issue, everyone has 50 issues. I've got 99 problems, right? So it's like, <laughs> which one do I need to? <laughs> You're getting off one? easy. <laughs> yeah, and, and Otel is not one, but yeah, but like, which of these do we want to work with, right? And having all the data in place just makes that process a lot easier. Okay, so earlier we talked about Dora and the book. We will make sure for those of you that are watching that we put the links there so you know where to find it, but where do the folks find out about OpenTelemetry? 
Yeah, Google.com, enter, go to the search bar, open. <laughs> Uh, I think Come on, I, man. I, we got to do better than that. There's a standard the, body. Yeah, I don't have the URL memorized. I'm, <laughs> I'm going to go with opentelemetry.org, but don't quote me. Don't yeah. quote me on it. Yeah, <laughs> it's live. It's already out there, folks. So, anyway, we'll make sure for those of you watching that we'll put the link so you can find the Open Telemetry. And then w one last thing that I'd like to leave people with: since you've been doing this a while and you've been running teams. For somebody that's just saying, look, we're trying to make that transition to the cloud, we're trying to move our apps, what are some best practices they can follow up? They're just getting started. Yeah, I mean, f the big thing for me was, again, tr I just keep coming back to it, treating your CI CD pipeline as an application, treating it as an Im as immutable infrastructure in the same way you're treating infrastructure as code, define your CI CD pipelines as code. All, um, all the major vendors now support the ability to declare via configuration what you want your CI CD pipelines to look like. And again, when that sprawl starts to occur, if you're following a best practice like that up front, it makes that process easier. Everything is defined as code. You can go through the same code review processes with your development or your DevOps team that you normally would for your production workloads. And then you can look at that as an application. You can start identifying, you know, as I add more and more pipelines, what are some of the common things in these config files that teams are doing? And DevOps teams can come together or a DevOps community and you can start to abstract chunks of common functionality into shared libraries, right? And it just starts making life easier so that everyone is not going off and creating their own bespoke CI CD pipelines. Wonderful. All right, we are about out of time. I want to thank Drew for joining us yeah, today and thank you me. all for yeah. joining us. If you have any questions, Drew will be here. He'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Thank you, everybody. And please remember to sign up for Navigating the Cloud Journey podcast so you can see this podcast and all the others up there. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you.